Welcome back to Wook Plus, Wook Plus Live. I'm Weekend Wook, joined by Great Went and T. And we have a hell of a guest tonight. We are going to be joined in a little bit by the one and only Matt Bush. A reoccurring guest now at this point. We are we are honored to have him on multiple times. What up? Friend, friend of the show. He's friend, friend of the, the show. show. I I would say that. It, well, I think after Dix, we, we got to hang out with Matt a little bit at Dix. I think at that point, that's when it really solidified. Uh, I think we could say that. Uh, I don't really have much up front. I just wanted to uh, say real quick, I had a, a little story. Uh, for those of you who don't know, my wife met Trey this past weekend, and I've been with her for 18 years. And in 18 years, I never had a picture with her as good as the picture of her and Trey. That guy just radiates pure joy and happiness. And, and oh, my God, it's funny. She said that he was the kindest, nicest person that you could even ever imagine talking to. Um, it has nothing to do with tonight's guest and, and what we're talking about tonight. But I just have been wanting to share that because I thought she's been through the, you know, through the moon with it. And uh, anyway, I'm a little jealous. Not not so much that she got to meet him, but just how great they look together. No, no, did, did, did she all mention Wook Plus to him? Thank God she did not. Because she didn't have an extra beanie on her to give him. <laughs> and what did she what did she say to him? to get to the picture and everything what was the meaning i mean she about? went up to him and she was just like hey <laughs> well no she was like hey i don't want to you know intrude but like we're huge fans and my daughter's middle name is joy and like you know and she's we're pregnant and you know so like that the whole thing but the cool thing was like she didn't really like grill him on things because she's not like all, like i would have been like what do you plan for the 40th anniversary or like <laughs> what's up with mercury dude and, and she was talking to Sue and like having just like casual fun, like human interactions, you know, not like nerdy jam band interactions. Um, yeah. That was my next question. Did Sue take the photo? I, yeah, I think so. Must have, or maybe, well then she was with her brother. So, uh, okay. And they were going to the symphony, the Philharmonic too. So I think they talked about that and you know, that's what was playing. Uh, I don't know. I wasn't there. <laughs> He decided to stay know. home and skip the yeah. harmonic. Oh, yeah, that's cool. no. that's awesome. Yeah, well, she, she was she was like, you should have gone. I, I stayed home to do like housework and stuff, and I was like, God damn it! Because right before she met him, she's like, Oh, I wish you came, and I was like, No, it's good I didn't come. And then like five minutes later, she texted me a picture of Trey. I was like, Oh, oh wow, well. that was fun. All right, you guys want to jump into this? this yeah, let's do this. All right, everybody, welcome, Mr. Matt Bush. Hey, hey. Matt. Hey. How are we doing? Welcome, welcome. Good to see How you. How's everything? You on the road again? I'm in a uh, Oakland Airport hotel. Yeah, you fly. So what? You guys have a uh, jazz fest coming up this weekend. You flying out? When are you flying out? Yeah, we're flying tomorrow to New Orleans. We'll get there tomorrow night. That's fun. That has to be a fun event. Damn. Yeah, I haven't actually been to jazz fest in 20 years. I think. Wow. Yeah. Nice. What's yeah, your? Uh, 2003. What What is your? What is the? itinerary look like when a band like dead and co and like you as like a manager and everything when you show up is it a lot of prep and stuff ahead of time because i i can imagine with like a regular show but this is a little unique with jazz fest what is your day gonna look um, like with bobby going to the all the way to the east coast i've started adding a um an extra day um travel's gotten so uh unpredictable there's so many more cancellations. It's so much harder to to solve problems when things are canceled that I've started just adding a, a just in case day. That's um, smart. Also, it's it uh, uh, if you if you put if say for instance they traveled Friday and they're on stage four thirty Saturday, coming from California for some reason flight gets delayed. They don't get into a hotel till two a.m. Friday night Saturday morning. They're on California time. You know that can mess that can mess with the show. Um, Sound check would be even earlier in the day than that if there was a sound check. So start having that extra day to adjust, you know, time zones and uh, and just in case day, just in case something goes wrong, you got a little bit of a buffer. Yeah, um, that's smart. So so um, you're going to have um, Thursday night, maybe Friday, Friday night in town. Uh, do you guys have your eyes on any night shows that someone may show up at? Um, I, I'm not aware of any. Uh, invites that he's said yes to. Um, I'm kind of hoping he doesn't do anything. Uh, I'm hoping to hang out with Low Faber during the day and have an old college buddy, my old college roommate, actually. I'm hoping to see him in the evening and 
and maybe with him go see government mule or something like that that's near where i'm staying um but yeah if bobby decides he's going somewhere then all that's off and that's where i'm going um, that's so going. no, no yeah, plans look, are confirmed until i'm actually doing them <laughs> right lo got this uh play a song with um leo nocentelli yep at the uh festival grounds so. yeah i saw that it's fantastic fantastic stuff so who's going to be on drums uh jay lane very nice very nice that's, that's what everyone was saying that's yep. good choice. Cornell too good choice. all right cool and the rest of the summer very nice very Perfect. nice awesome. so very let's good. get into set list um <laughs> are are there um i know you've said before that nobody really wants to learn new songs since it's the last tour will that change maybe um what i think is more likely to happen based on what i've heard in rehearsals is um i think they just might fall into new songs um there there was a wonderful 15 minute piece of the sort of in the middle of playing in the band uncle john's band and it improved into two different songs um uh, one was just guitar riff um and then you know the rhythm section kind of fell in behind it and the other john started singing um and then bobby he started singing dear prudence over all of that in the uncle john's band's sort of seven section um you know if, if that's sort of the direction the improv is going to go then then i think that's that's where the you know if they're going to get a little more fearless with that then i think that's where stuff they haven't done is gonna is gonna come out of right can, um, can i just put in a plug for sitting on top of the world as an opener one night you know we used to do that with further and we've opened i think we opened with it actually at the man center um is something i'm remembering for some reason um there was a song uh, john k sang though i don't think it's really in bobby's register um, right right um <laughs> but, just uh, one of my favorite i like the idea i've used it as an opener before because if i can remember that then <laughs> Kev wants to turn this into total requ request live. Like, <laughs> let's hop that on. So you know, I I I will absorb, try, attempt to absorb all ideas like a sponge, and 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 just you know play, you know just I play a very long game with ideas I like. Um, and uh, have you started you have thinking to. about set list yet, or is that something you wait until like right up well, before the show? Saturdays. I I wrote Cornell. Um, well, Cornell. Cornell was tricky, but it was done a long time ago. Um, just leave leave it at that. I was going to say, wrote, you're not going to You can't say a lot. I wrote, I wrote Cornell, Jazz but... Fest. I wrote Jazz Fest very quickly after sort of, after I, after I knew what we were going to do with Cornell, I wrote Jazz Fest very quickly after. Um, and I'm surprised um, that it it's actually hasn't changed really at all. Um, because I, I usually expect more changes going into the first show of tour, like more last minute um, changes. But at this point, since they won't sound check, it's probably locked in. Um, from the band, you're talking about changes from the band? Like yeah. I mean, usually before a first show of tour, uh, I feel like that, that set list gets to a B, C, D, E, F, you know. Um, right. I feel like it changes more before we, we actually get there and do it. Um, whereas once we sort of get rolling, sometimes they change very little. Um, I have a feeling this summer the end product is going to be a lot different than what the day started on paper. I, you know, I, th I think, uh, I think I can see that coming this summer. I think that that's, you know, I think cause Jay is so locked in with Bobby. I think that that helps that. Um, yeah, just gonna, from a creativity standpoint. Yeah. I think, yeah. Um, I was going to say, does each city or do, is there certain things that you know you guys want to do in certain cities or certain songs that you know should, need not necessarily need to but want to be played for the last time in certain cities for certain i have to keep that in mind um you know i definitely have to be mindful of uh you know making sure you know even tuesday in st louis doesn't just end up being like all right here's the chance to like do 16 tour debuts at 18 <laughs> you know they're, right. they're gonna you know everyone's gonna need their soul food a little extra this right go around because it might be some of the last time they see you know it's not gonna be the last time they see grateful that music because bobby you know we already have september dates and that's there's more to add there. Um, you know, Bobby's not going to be done hitting every city he can get to in the country. Um, but it could be the last time they see a, a see a, a, you know, this type of band in the amphitheater or stadium or, you know, in the big, right. bigger band go around of it. Um, or it might not him and Mickey, you know, 2025 is not too far away. You never know what 
what it's going to come up with. How much um, urge do you have to either do the obvious or not do the obvious? Like, you know, New Orleans, there's one or two songs that immediately pop in my head as New Orleans things. And yeah, you-, uh, you know, it was interesting uh, with the Campfire Band, um, uh, the guys, you know, Aaron Desna, the guys in the National who were in that band, Josh Kaufman, were very eager to do that kind of low-hanging fruit stuff. And, and it was with them that it occurred to me how many different Grateful Dead or Grateful Dead covered songs reference New Orleans or Louisiana. And it got to the point by set two where the crowd wasn't even roaring for it anymore. <laughs> like they definitely overdid it. It's like there were that many. Um, so yeah, there'll be, there'll certainly be a couple. Um, right. Uh, but I, I don't, with the New Orleans, because of that, I stopped thinking about it. Um, I won't put Ico Ico in a set list unless like the band asks for it proactively. Um, I feel like, that was the obvious of the obvious. Um, I was thinking. Yeah, no, I make. I, I won't. I won't any, if, if it's ever been in any of my set lists in New Orleans, it's because the band say, "Hey, we want to do Ico Ico." I feel like, you know, <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know, it's, it's the city the song originates in. It's up to them if they want to do it there or not. You know, because I feel like you got you got to do a really good version of Ico if you're doing it in New Orleans. Yeah, they got to um, be. So, so they got to be. It. They got to be feeling it exactly. Bring out some yeah. Mardi Gras Indians or something with you if you're going to bust it out. Um, you know, uh, there's going to be some. There's going to be some local flavor in the mix there that, nice. that, that I think is nice. going to be cool. Um, yeah, I'm bummed to hear that they're not. I guess I didn't realize this, but Jazz Fest never really streams their their no. sets, right? No. But we'll definitely be able to get Cornell. I think that's going to be everywhere, right? Yeah, Cornell, I think there's free audio on Nugs or Nugs' YouTube channel, like like we do with Wolf Bros. Um, there's Nugs pay-per-view video, there's Sirius XM, if you have that, um, it's broadcasting it. Um, and I'm sure the recordings will up, end up on Nugs' streaming service after. Right. And I guess this will be a good time to plug. Uh, if you haven't heard yet, we will Wook Plus will be doing after shows 15 minutes after Encore for every Dead & Co. Show, that, show this year. With the exception of Jazz Fest, because nobody's <laughs> going to be streaming it. But once Cornell on, we'll be doing the after shows. So make we sure won't stop in. until they do. <laughs> this, this will actually be my third show at Barton Hall that I've worked, which is kind of oh, wild. Yeah. Um, there was a Phil Esch, Bob Dylan show in 1999. It was like a college tour. Um, I was actually just rem- reminiscing about that at the Willie Nelson event with the couple of Dylan's people and uh, we did a further show there in 2010 on Valentine's Day and uh so right, let's what, hear about let's hear about the joint at the Willie show yeah I want to hear all about <laughs> the, the 20 gram event. joint <laughs> the 20 gram joint yeah. yes uh so the 20 gram joint is not the first time I've I've actually had one of those um it comes from uh a cannabis company called Full Moon Farms uh owned by a guy named Nick or is one of the partners at Humboldt based um, they love to outfit the backstage of Sweetwater, and that's how we got to know them. Um, so they, uh, at the Bobby did a Rambling Jack Elliott, a benefit for Rambling Jack Elliott, sort of a private, uh, on last Sunday. Um, it was right before we went to LA for Dead Co. rehearsals. And they were there, you know, sort of had like a little cannabis bar. Um, and they gave Margot Price that joint. And... She decided that after the Willie event ends, that's the time to just light it up backstage. And um, most shows, you know, the house lights are barely up and we're already in a vehicle out the door. But the setup of this was we actually had to wait for like 30, 40 minutes before we were allowed to leave. Um, so I come backstage and stumble upon Margot and um, Billy Strings and Nathaniel Rateliff and Woody. Woody, Woody, ha- right? Woody Harrelson passed me the joint, and I, I took a head out of it, going, "I can't believe this is happening right now." That this is, it's, I'm looking around trying to, and I'm definitely leaving people out of it. Um, and Top I shelf one rotation to Billy there. or back to Margot. Yeah, what do they call uh, that? Margot and I laughed rotation? because we both know where it came from, you know, and she knew I knew where she got it. Um, Bobby actually came over and hit it. And that's very rare. Um, it was Willie's birthday. I mean, it was Willie's 90th birthday. And- when in Rome. <laughs> yeah, and it was actually pretty good. Usually, pre rolls in general are, are, are Garbage. not that good. But uh, he looks um, fucking great for nine. Danny Clinch was there. He definitely hit it and was taking probably has pictures and videos of the whole thing, the whole deal. Um, so, what did Bobby and, uh, play with Willie? 
Uh, the first night he did Blue Eyes Crying in the Rain. Um, and it was with, uh, he did a sort of stripped down version of the house band. Billy Strings took over for the guitar player. Greg Lee's on pedal steel. Mickey Raphael on harmonica. Don was on bass. Terrence Higgins on drums. And I think it was just that that group. And then the next night he did uh, Stay All Night, Stay A Little Longer and added Margot Price, Billy, and then, but that was full house band. Um, and then, you know, they were all, you know, there was sort of an everyone on, on the, so the first, on the, you know, the finale, which uh, the first night I think was Circle Be Unbroken, I'll Fly Away maybe. And um, then I think the second night it was on the road again. Um, um, and then I'm sure something else after that, I feel like it went on a little longer than that. And then they all sang happy birthday to, Bill, to Willie. And, uh, um, That's my uh, daughter's favorite song on the road. Again, every time we get in the car, it's the first thing she wants to hear, but it, it's cool. Cause from the bakers, I have like an emotional connection with it too. Has not the, I'm sorry. It was a weird <laughs> tangent, but it just, <laughs> like, I love that song. So, so, so Terrence Higgins was one drums. Was yes. he, is does he have a connection with you guys or did he just happen to be there because he's in new orleans fantastic new orleans drummer if you all don't know who he is yeah, so don was was a musical director and he put together the house band um and uh you know he, he, he knew the right, right? Guy. oddly freed was one of the guitar players jamie johnson was uh immersed in the house band as a guitar player for a chunk of the night um you know a lot of you know billy did that a bunch of times a lot of the, you know it was a really good house band greg lee's okay. like i said had the mccurry sisters as backup singers Ben Montench, uh, Petty's band on, okay. on B3 and, and piano. Um, and this was Blackbird, right? Yeah, Keith Warman and Blackbird. Yeah, Productions. Keith Warman, yep. yep. Very nice. Um, and yeah, they pulled it off really well. They uh, Both nights came in under. Um, yeah, there, there was a guy on Twitter live tweeting, like everybody who was playing every song and little clips. I was like, that's a hero's work you're doing there, man. Getting that out <laughs> like that. He actually is the guy who runs Bro Bible, owns Bro Bible. Let's try to know what that is. Uh, yeah, it, it's an online magazine kind of thing. He's been around for a while, a long time, and he's ahead, so he's into it. Um, you you want to talk fish at yeah. Seattle? <laughs> Please, yeah. Yeah, right. well, so what do you think? What's your um, overall impression? Um, night one, I I thought the first set, they seemed they seemed like in mid tour form. I loved the opening uh, the opening segue, the little opening sandwich was a uh, blaze oh, on yeah. plasma blaze on. Plasma, um, right. That held up through the tour, I think. Um, one of I thought that highlights. was great. The second set kind of lost me. I got a little bored. I mean the the um. The golden age, the segue into golden age and golden age. I enjoyed uh, the jam and it was a wave of hope that opened that set. Yeah, got interesting yeah. places. I just you know, some songs that that are more referred to as jam vehicles uh, don't don't do much for me. Um, if I don't like the song, then where the jam re resolves is going to be a big deal. If it's resolved back into a song that doesn't really work for me, then you know, that's kind of where I'm left with it. And there was a little bit too much of that in the second set for me. Um, yeah, it got. I mean, it definitely got super type two and a little bit weird and spacey. And then there's not really a great climax or conclusion for it if you're not looking forward to that song. Right, right. Yeah, wave um, of hope. Wave of hope is very grateful, Daddy, to me in the way the jam is. It's very organic. It doesn't see. It isn't angular and fishy. I right. guess. I yeah. <laughs> No, it makes I sense. love it. It's it's my favorite of the 4.0 songs. Uh, I, I've been high on it since day one. So. Um, and then the second night I loved, I mean, uh, it was probably one of my favorite shows since 2009. I mean, other, you know, other than Isabella ending up in leaves, was it? Um, <laughs> yeah. and, and the encores, um, I, that was my kind of show. I mean, that completely worked from beginning, beginning to end. Um, yeah. and granted, I haven't seen a lot of shows since 2009. So, you know, maybe 10 to 15, somewhere in that range, but, um, it was definitely one of my favorites uh, since then. Um. Is it hard to see music? Not, I guess not hard, but like to turn off your professional, like working brain and to just be like there, you know, as a fan. I mean, cause like, obviously you're not working the fish show, but like, that's a very similar environment to what you do professionally. There's a story I, I can tell you from night two where that was really put to the test. Um, you know, we, we had tickets through the band and uh, which meant the people around me did too. And it became obvious that, all the tickets in our row had also been sold on Ticketmaster. Mm -hmm. 
because people kept coming down with Ticketmaster seats for them, and they were slowly moving people. So I knew, oh, you know, I, I, I knew it was kind of inevitable. This is probably happening to us too at some point. Um, uh, but at the same time, I'm thinking, you know, if they've given away these seats or sold them, and they've also been sold on Ticketmaster, that means they've been double sold. And I hope the band's getting paid for them. Like I should say something to someone, you know, because yeah, how how will they know unless someone says something, you know? And and actually, if they knew this happened and I didn't say anything, I'd, you know, have to explain that. So, uh, so yeah, set break. Uh, Usher comes down and she wants to move us, and and you know, it, it tells you know tells me. You know, there'll be better seats. Don't worry. I'm like, okay, but what does that mean? I'm like, you know, can I see them first? I'm like, why don't you walk me to where they are and then I can decide? Um, so she says, okay, she walks me down and around. And it's a little further back from the stage, but it is in, in the first row and we're in the fourth or fifth and and it'll work. So come back. Um, but, you know, I, it wasn't enough for me. Uh, it was with Katie and we were also hanging out with Scoy, even though we only had two seats there. Yeah. I said, okay, I'll do this, but I need three seats now. <laughs> so he's got to come with us. Um, I love partying with Scoy. He's awesome. And uh, he was a lot of fun. And, uh, you know, so I'm trying to just be cool. And, you know, but at the same time, I'm like, uh, you know, I know right from wrong here. And and I need to make sure we're going to be treated fairly. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, I, I went after we got relocated. I was like, I should go in the back and find someone and just say, hey, this happened. And uh, I found Jason Colton, one of their managers, and explained. And he said again. And basically, it seems like every single band seat in both nights so this somehow lucky that didn't happen to us the first night um, computer glitch um <laughs> Something. yeah uh they, they said it's a new venue um the box office they said are wonderful lovely people uh but they're new and they're making a lot of mistakes and you know so yeah they so took my, took my seat and phone number just to go figure out how many times the seat had been sold and, and make sure it was settled up and we, uh, they moved us to a seat called Cove 17. <laughs> oh, I remember seeing all the things um, about yeah. that. <laughs> and uh, um, I misheard it as Code 17. So Sorry. I was like, what the hell is going on here? Like, like is this like a code word for relocating people? <laughs> like I, I was so confused. Um, but, you know, I was trying to keep track of where they're moving us to because now I don't, have a, I don't have a ticket for where I am. And if I need to leave seat to go do something, I, I got to remember how to where to go back to. Um but uh, yeah, there was a time where I had you know had to sort of remember I'm not working here, but yeah. I also know how this should be handled if it was happening to one of my guests at one of our shows, you know. And so you would have jumped into go mode if that was I happening. I jumped and... into go mode if I felt like I need to, but she did the right thing. I think she realized I knew what I was doing, and maybe I was making her a little nervous, but uh, it all worked out in the end. Shit. Yeah, I wonder <laughs> if that had anything to do with the second set not resonating as well. Because like for I, maybe I'm projecting a little bit, but for me, like I need. This to get was night two, and I love the second set. Actually, oh, okay. I, I, I feel like the, 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 we were so buzzed from the move that it actually enhanced the set. Um, okay, because like I need to get settled, and but like I've had made, shows that so that will ruin your night. One of the reasons why move. I knew this would work is our seats were didn't really they weren't fixed. They were sort of just folding chairs placed right. in a section, and it was empty. Um, it filled up, of course, as the set started, but I actually pushed the row back. Um, and so we more probably had there. double the space, and there was no row behind us, it was just empty. And like, if I sat down, I could put my, stretch my feet all the way out. Like, you know, I was, I was if we're gonna move, nice. it's gonna be an up, if we're gonna be inconvenience, it's gonna be an upgrade. You know? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> gonna, sure. We're gonna do everything I can to make sure of that because nobody so wants to move mid set, you know, in general. That's terrible, or, or uh, in mid show, it's set break, yeah. yeah. Um, so how much gear does Dead & Company travel with? Um, I mean, I haven't seen... I can let you know. Well, actually, for now, I won't be able to... You know, I probably won't be a full lighting rig. Right. Um, I won't really know for sure until till the forum or till the state. I bet the trucks probably vary based on stadium, too. Probably had a lot of yeah. lighting. Um, but it's usually in the 10, 11, 12 truck range, depending on right. lighting and video. Lighting and video takes up the most, uh, most truck space. Very nice. So you guys don't ever use local stuff. You're like, we need our gear. Yeah, no, we want... We pretty much want our gear right it's like building a city yeah it really it really is especially a stadium show i mean, yeah, I mean um, what's it, the biggest venue you're playing it, it sometimes is mind-blowing that i walk into places that they've taken two three days to build 
and I walk in there, spend four or five hours and walk out and then take some another two days to tear it down <laughs> all for the band to be there for four or five, six hours. And they, I always love that when they start before everybody's even out, like I always try to hang out at the end after encore, I'll sit and kind of like, you know, catch my vibe. And I love seeing the crew come out right away and like how hard working they are. Yeah. They're bringing right on top of they up, like, you lay out backline first, then usually uh, yeah. sound, then lighting, then video, and do, do, don't they do the Jackson Brown tune and something about the roadies? Oh, oh yeah, uh, load out, stay a little bit longer. Stay, yeah, stay a little bit longer. Um, <laughs> uh, I've never, I haven't heard that tune played at the, at the end of our shows, but the... <laughs> right, but but isn't there one of the songs that they sing that in the stay just a little bit longer? Doesn't Mayor oh, uh, Mayor sings that in the wheel sometimes? Yes, yeah. As also, right. he's also done a uh, Paul Simon tune in that diamond, diamonds on the soles of her shoes. Her shoes. Um, now, is that something rehearsed, or he's just like I'm throwing? No, it he's in just, he just improv that those times. Hmm. Um, Very nice. How much um, do they? Uh, how much do they rehearse stuff like the jazz tunes they'll do out of space? All improv. All improv. So when we're hearing that that's um you know Spanish jam or something, it's Spanish theme. It's just our heads making it up. Um, no, uh, I mean, Jeff's the, all that stuff's being done deliberately. I mean, but it's all like it's usually done in the moment, unless if I'm managing the time and they have extra time, I'll go to Jeff. It usually that stuff usually originates with Kimenti, and I'll go whisper in his ear, you know, do it, you know, you usually just sort of go, you know, I treat it like a rotation. If they did jazz last time, I'll be like, hey, maybe Spanish Jam tonight, or uh, last two tours, I've gotten to do uh, uh, blues for all the teams. Um, so you're in his space. ear with that call. Like uh, monitor? I, I can be. It doesn't. No, I when they come off during drums, um, that's oh, sort of a, a time check moment for me and the guys. Uh, if it's strict curfew and based on space and whatever's left there and how much time I see we have, that's where we maybe have to cut a song. Or if they have looks like extra time, my first move is usually to try to get Kimenti to go through uh, milestones or favorite things or any of the jazz standards. Uh, so what else do they started coming up? Um, Sorry, what else do they do during drums? I always wondered that. Like, are they just standing there, like listening, or is like go? They're usually a, listening. Uh, you know, and... there's can be a bathroom break. Uh, definitely a, a summer tour, especially it's, you know water, uh, uh, you know electrolytes, whatever. Um, in that moment, some toweling off, and and then yeah, I I will time check with with Bobby some or some combo of Bobby, John, Jeff, um, and yeah, I'll use that moment if it's time to add something to. Try to get, either try to get Jeff to do it out of space. If that doesn't happen for whatever reason, uh, then I'm thinking about a double encore if there's only one on paper or something are, like that. Are they pretty consistent with, say, an estimated is always nine minutes or 12 minutes or whatever? Uh, you know, it, it, I'll take an hour. Like for Jazz Fest, I, I went on Nugs and looked at the last two, three times they played any of those songs and just took an average. Um, and, uh, you know, and tried to leave myself a little bit of a cushion just in case. Um um, cause that's one, two and a half hours set. And, uh, um, you know, I don't, I don't want to go over. That's like right. the Do they charge you there? ever. <laughs> Do they charge you to go? I don't think charge is an option. I get the feeling the, the, the plug will be pulled at, at <laughs> seven, seven. I, you know, so it's funny. I've had to have these debates with the, it came up with the Atlanta orchestra when I had to buy some overtime. Um, um, some venues it's when the turn seven you're done some it's you have till seven is when it turns to seven oh you know or eleven eleven oh one you're done but that minute can matter with this music um the atlanta symphony union musician over time it was it, when it turned 10 or 10 or whatever the hour was that time you were done so if, it was, if it was 10 or two in one second you paid for the third minute right well in this case with the Atlanta Symphony, it was five minute increments, which actually worked out great. So, like, honestly, I only need one more song. So, I'm going to buy 15 minutes now and just, you know, I'm good. You know, we're good for 15. So, if it comes in under, great. But uh, um, we'll buy at least that much to make sure we can, we can do all that. I didn't what about you could buy that ahead of time? That's really yeah. interesting. Um, you know, now that I know some orchestras do five minute increments and not all make you buy a half hour, which could be prohibitive. Or, you know 65 to 85 musicians um um i might start uh oh. next symphony show start maybe just pre-negotiating 15 minutes knowing i can add you know one or two songs right, um, what about a place like deer creek that charges you if you go over is that are you ever like screw it we'll pay the money 
Uh, I know what I have a I have in a pre-approved budget that I can just uh, do per show. So I, I know what I know what's acceptable for them, and I know what where I have to kind of draw the line. Okay, we need to stop. Um, right. Tom, I would love this band to do a full weather report suite, and if I can make it happen, <laughs> it'll be fully. It'll be Philly, but uh, I don't know that it could be done without the Wolfpack doing the intro anymore. Um, <laughs> that um, would be sweet. That part's so been a little challenging for Bob and just his hands, and so uh, um, and uh, I think I need. I, I think I would need a guest sit in by the Wolfpack to pull off a full weather report suite with Dead and Company. Um, so Wolfpack just got off a fantastic tour. You want to talk a little bit about oh, what yeah, they're up to? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so we have seven September dates uh, on the Willie Nelson Outlaw Tour. Um, this is a good year. Uh, um, a good year to be beyond that. It looks like we have uh, String Cheese and St. Los Lobos and uh, Particle Kid, who's Mike and Nelson, um, are all on, on the bill every night with there. Um, so I could see a lot of collaborations for Bobby uh, in addition to the, I think, 75-minute Wolf Rose set we'll get to do every night. Um, the Pine Knob show on that tour will be my 50th birthday, so uh, um, I'm already starting to think of what I want to ask him to to try and do for that. <laughs> so I'm gonna try. <laughs> so I'll have to be working in the middle of nowhere, Michigan, on my birthday, and, and uh, um, I think it's only fair to Midwest. play with that set a little bit. Yeah, is, it going, crazy. Is, is it the whole thing with the strings this time, or is it just the five piece? No, we're taking the ten piece on the Willie tour. Yeah. Um, nice. Um, we're taking the 10 piece on the Willie tour. Um, and that should be, I, yeah, I, I think part of that is, I think they'll, I think both the horns and strings will end up also doing a lot of sitting in themselves, um, which should be fun. And, and, uh, then we'll, there's, there'll be, uh, uh, we're also at the park city song summit festival before that starts. Um, and, uh, there'll probably be three or four, uh, evening with dates, uh, in between all that. And after that, um, um, and that's the two set shows, the evening where. Yeah, so yeah, evening with shows would be a full two set shows. Uh, Willie, w Bobby could play a little more per week than Willie can. Um, right. Being, you know, 15 years his junior. It's <laughs> um, mind boggling. Weekend. I used to um, think Bob Weir was old in like 87. I was like, <laughs> so old. It's... Well, yeah, you were, you were a really. kid then. I was 16, yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> what can um, I do? Looks great. Um, You mind um, if I. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. And that's the Wolf Boys will have some more. There'll be some more shows to be announced in December as well. Um, even pondering a possible New Year's run. Nice. I wanted to pivot back to the the final Dead and Co tour the, the uh, that's coming up because when this was announced, one thing that struck me, and I, I was very curious to ask you, and I don't know if there's anything there, but it seemed to me like the dates and the tour were announced earlier than usual, or at least earlier than. A, like any other band in in that you know in like yeah. the jam scene was that a strategic move was there a, like a logic behind that or is that just when it was ready and it was like hey let's get it out we have the dates locked in um I, I, it was, first a strategic of all, was it move. early it was early yeah it was definitely early for us it was october it was on sale in october announced in october because i remember we were actually doing our kennedy center symphony shows and it was a little it was an intense week to be doing both things at once um but uh the reason, you know, there was, it, there was no better, you know, the next week was his 75th birthday. So there was no let up for us. So it was going to be that kind of timing, regardless of when we went. Um, but the, uh, the real drive was it being the last tour, let as many people have as much time as possible to make plans to go as many shows as they want. Um, yeah, that's awesome. You know, like since we know that's the, what this is going to be and we, we have the routing we like. Um, so there, yeah, it was, yeah. Did it work out? Have ticket sales been good or things uh, selling out? Were, yeah, I mean, it's it's uh, it, it it blew out pretty quickly, and it's I mean, I think the tour is sitting at ninety six percent sold or something. Nice, something yeah, I was pretty just ridiculous looking at like that. I mean, Ticketmaster uh, earlier, at yes, the forum like shows. I know, I know, SPAC. There's still not really cheap tickets anywhere for yeah for those yeah, shows. I mean, yeah. some of the stadiums, I think prices will come down. I think City Field is is uh, um, actually accounts for a lot of that that four percent that's out there. Um, which is unusual being New York City, but I think it being during the week and with so much weekend activity around it, um, that could be a factor. But I have a feeling it's it's going to be 100% sold by the time it plays through or as close to it as you could get. I mean, I feel like a stadium show, there's always some place to put somebody, you know? Yeah. Uh, if you can't, you know, I think most people find their way, way into a stadium. I mean, anytime I've had to wander outside of a, a supposed sold-out stadium show, 
after the music has started, I'm not really seeing a lot of people still looking to get in. You know, they all they all seem to well, there's find two, their way in. There's two kind of fans I've found in, in my in my experience. There's a Kev, a, a Went, and me. Kev's the guy that the <laughs> second it's announced, he makes all his plans and he wants to have all his ducks in a row. I'm the guy that gets anxiety if I do the opposite of what you would think. I get anxiety if I do things too early. Like if the <laughs> thought of like even in May, the thought of planning out like July, I'm like, uh, it's. I don't want to get ahead of myself, right? I don't know where I'm going to be. So th- I imagine there'll be another surge for that last four to 6%, you know, of, of people that are like, Hey, it's, it's too far out. Like I'm not ready to, you know, do that. I, I mean, the le- lesson I've learned is there's no better advertisement to sell tickets to this music than the music itself, you know, mm-hmm. but like, there's no, the other, right. The thing about going on sale in October and not playing a show until May is if you're not really sold and you need to somehow juice ticket sales, not a whole lot you could do without playing a show with this kind of music. Like there's no, you know, video marketing gimmick, <laughs> you know, it's, it's not a pop show. It's not going to work. They, you know, the, mu- the music has to be good or they're not going to buy tickets. Yeah. Um, especially at the prices we're selling them at. Um, and so, you know, we, we got a bump after Mexico with what was left. And uh, I expect Jazz Fest and Cornell do more of the same. Um, and once we get going. Mexico was fantastic. Yeah. What are your thoughts on Bobby coming out with Goose? What did you make of that? Oh, I mean, that was so much fun. I loved it. Um, it was fun putting that together. It was great getting to know those guys. I've known Ben Brook, the manager, for a long time. So it was fun to do that with him. Um, and and it, it was a conversation that didn't stop, basically, because... Uh, the Bobby shows at the Capitol Theater came up right after it, and, and it was almost a nonstop conversation until there. Um, I mean, Bobby invited the Goose guys. They were staying at a different resort than us. We invited them over every single day from the day before they played until they had left. I had left. He was still there, and he actually texted me for Rick's number like to invite them over, and I'm like, they're gone. <laughs> <laughs> um, he had a lot of fun with them. Um, we actually just got a big box uh, merch and vinyl from them, and, and he told me he loved the way, he, without even me asking if he'd listened to it yet, he just, I, I listened to Goose Wreck, really, really liked it. And then, the, you know, I got to point out that actually their producer was one of the engineers and studios on his Blue Mountain record, uh, Daniel James Goodwin. We did a lot of the Blue Mountain recording at his Woodstock studio. Um, and he engineered cool. and I think played on a little bit of it and, and actually did all the content creation for the video we did on that tour. Um, and he produced the, the goose record. Um, so there was a little connection there for him too. Is there going to be, Go ahead. is there ever going to be new Bobby tunes? Is he ever going to write new songs? I've heard Bruce Springsteen say when Howard Stern that at this point, he doesn't even bother want to write songs anymore. He doesn't have the drive to do it anymore. He, um i mean bobby wants to you know he's got the one new song that's been recorded you know he's working on an album as you know um it's it's a bobby album but it's it's got all the wolf bros and some of the wolf pack on it so far uh, but there's a one brand new tune on that album that he's been playing live she knows what i'm thinking um the two he started with jd souther at the guild theater live I don't, i'm not sure if you guys saw, saw any of that um we opened the second sets of the first three shows that run, just Bobby and JD Souther trying to do live real time songwriting. Um, and they've got the start of two songs, one a little more than the other, the one they did the first night, uh, which they came back to on the third night. Um, and uh, it, I know he's, you know, we, we tracked those out and I've sent them to him. And I know he's been talking to JD some more. I know JD is also on the, Park City song summit. So I see some more. I could see something coming out of that. Um, this weekend, uh, Bobby uh, had a great hang with Lyle Lovett, who expressed interest in writing with him. Um, That's cool. And, uh, you know, a lot of his conversations there, I think, centered around, you know, anyone he could write a song always, with someday. A couple others that I won't mention yet. And, I always um, hope that it would open up Bobby more. Um, you know, Barlow was by his side all those years. When Barlow wasn't there, I really like that bobby said hey there are lots of other people who can write a good lyric for me and bring them in right now jd souther aaron radieri who who both worked on she knows what i'm thinking um are in the mix there um and uh you know obviously josh ritter wrote blue mountain with him um they 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 started talking again after we noticed bob dylan cover only a river in in japan that was fantastic Um, 
Um, and I spent time with Dylan's manager this past weekend. The one else thing, even he can't explain to me what was going on in Dylan's mind with all those Grateful Dead covers and then only a river every single night. Um, uh, right. no one, no He's one digging it. He was, really, he was digging it. You know, I got a song in my head a couple weeks ago. I listened to it every day for like two weeks. Well, he was excited by it. A, he loves those tunes, and B, he knows like the dead, the Grateful Dead has never played Japan, nor will they. So in his mind, it was like, you know, these people you have any idea what's going on. <laughs> What do you think about that rumor of fish playing Japan? I mean, I'm not saying insider if you knew anything, like if you talked to management, but just hypothetically from like a management standpoint, do you think that kind of move would make sense for that band at this point? Or is that just all fan bullshit? I didn't know there was that rumor. Um, oh, <laughs> all right. Well, <laughs> let me catch you up. There's a rumor that, <laughs> that Fish is, um, is booking a tour. But what I would Japan. say is for a band like that, it's probably not going to be financially feasible. So it's do they want to go to Japan and play, you know, and, and if so, how much are they willing to spend to do it to determine how they would do it, you know? Right. It'd be like you want to go um, on vacation. Or, oh, let's go play some clubs while we're on vacation, basically, rather than making it a big financial move. All right. Um, you know, uh, um, I'll say this. I think they're, uh, you know, actually, wait, the fish rumor is for when? Uh, uh, it doesn't say there's a website that's fish J A and it, when you go to it, it says, um, look for something. It's all written in Jap Japanese. And when you translate it, it talks about the fish people coming to conquer Japan. That's fascinating. Um, you know, I do, I, I'm aware of another artist, uh, sort of in our world that, uh, is pondering a similar thing. Actually. I, mean, I wonder if the rumor mixed up, uh, <laughs> so this is the fish.jp which is like oh, wow. the dot com over there and that's their uh -huh. artwork from the japan uh live dead release and and the the from thought was is Wait, that... who's japan release the uh, fish is 2000 uh live fish release not live dead live fish release oh, God. okay yeah, was... so from naka hmm. i don't know the, the interesting it. part about it though is that they just did this loss they did an injunction for trademark violations for uh, it was a separate issue right like with merch at the venues but this is something that they could easily have shut down if it wasn't an official thing right right because it's it's a it's fish it's not like uh you know it's like it's their name and it's been up there the whole time so right. i don't know wow. um i, I know, feel I like saw, if it I wasn't for real they would have the knocked it down um yeah um, have you, you ever had a junction is against a john doe who yeah, yeah i mean you Copyright law, trademark law, you have to proactively protect it or you, it could be considered abandoned. Um, mm -hmm. So I know we, you know, I know at our bigger shows, we, we've had injunctions. I mean, Grateful Dead had injunctions. Um, you know, they generally use it against the, you know, the cheap knockoff stuff that's just taking the the tour poster and slapping it on a T-shirt for 10 bucks or that kind of thing. Usually that's, that's what not fish going, is after. going after. Usually that's not going after kids who are, you know. Uh, you know, and anytime we change or add bootleg, please, I try to go explain who, who to, you know, I give the speech, who we're looking for, who we're not. I've done that for them, you know, for, for dead. Right. Bootleg, not please. the artists on Shakedown that are doing like original right. creative work and just right. Even they're a little stuff. questionable. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm not too concerned. You know, it, it, when there's so much blatant, go after the blatant when it's so much there. You know, again, you have to, you have to protect it or it could be considered abandoned so i get what i have to do it but usually right if i stick a steal your people. face if i stick a steal your face on a white shirt you're going to be like dude you aren't an artist right. but if i hand draw one in a moon or something you're going to be like I don't know. all right dude you're, i don't you think know. anybody's going after steelies though i mean that's the most overdone thing on every lot in america like that's why people go, go to, after it it's easy yeah. <laughs> you still have to <laughs> yeah. i mean the design itself is just perfect Thanks, for screen printing it's it, you know <laughs> Three colors, you know. <laughs> That's how I met Tom. He was a bootleg police in Philly. <laughs> <laughs> but that way, so but just before we, I know we've been jumping all over the place. That is not an uncommon thing, right? Like no. these injunctions, it's it's just standard practice. No, you kind of have to have them, otherwise you're you're sort of. What's it? Three it years or something? After something three like years, that. it's abandoned. Yeah. yeah, and you just make them as broad as possible, so you can, you know, use them. When yeah, because there's said then, fish, yeah. game henge non-trademark vital blue because i guess you can't <laughs> trademark a baseball guy's name <laughs> that's actually a good point <laughs> so poor page so let me ask you <laughs> you seem to know a little bit about this i was always under the impression when i used to sell shirts that you could use a title because you can't copyright a title but you can't stick the lyric one there because that violates the copyright no it violates the the publishing yeah you need so, the, the songwriter's permission 
Right. You, know, you should write a book on that, Kev. Like how to get away with selling <laughs> how to get a, how to get merch. Amy not to chase you. The <laughs> Amy who used to work for Fish <laughs> popped me a few times. So yeah, Amy know. was uh, when I was twenty five and starting with Government Mule, and you know we were figuring out what you know what we should and shouldn't be doing. I, actually, she was generous enough to give me like the forty five minute over the phone lesson on injunctions and all that kind of stuff. Um, and uh, that was yeah how I first learned about that. I just always love that story of her chase or of Kev just bolting. Amy comes, he's like, <laughs> oh, Amy chased you down one day. <laughs> well, at, at Clifford Ball, I was selling Game Hinge University stickers that like go on the back of your car, like University of Maryland or something. And I had like ten of them, and she's like, give them to me. And I like hand them to me, and these two guys start walking over. I turn around and take off because I had like two hundred more in my backpack, <laughs> and just shoot down an aisle. And I was—I like, imagine she <laughs> wasn't actually chasing you though. You just got like paranoid, and everybody's just looking like, "Why is this book running in your way?" <laughs> no, I thought for sure they were coming for the book bag, and I was like, "I don't have the money to lose two hundred stickers. I'll take the hit on ten, you know." <laughs> Oh god! And meanwhile, now if we write a show with Kev, he just sits there in his meditative state. I was like, can't picture you running. Yeah, oh. my running oh. days are over. Yeah. So I think uh, Nate here asked about uh, Bobby and Mike thing at TRI. Um, that was a Mike Gordon uh, conducted brainwave experiment. Um, I'm not quite sure exactly <laughs> what the goal is. Um, I know the headsets they were wearing. Um, the inventor of them was in the studio. Um, Mike and these sort of guys have been going back and forth on this kind of stuff for decades. I believe Bobby got roped into it during the pandemic. Um, remember a Zoom or two about it. And uh, it has something to do with measuring the brain waves while they're performing and improvising. Um, seeing what part of the brain they're using i, I don't know that much even or <laughs> or what they got out of it or anything to do with that even uh even the fish people i was setting this up with weren't 100 percent sure <laughs> they would say just ask mike and every they're, time they're I, mike, I, I, I left the conversation more confused than, than the time before <laughs> um and, uh, mike, to AI. Uh, what i can say is, AI. is uh it actually sounded better musically than i expected uh they warmed up or sound checked on like a blues riff that was kind of on Wang Dang Doodle, and then they did "He's Gone," Cassidy, and China Rider, and I was, I, I enjoyed it, and I think Mike enjoyed it, it musically more than he expected to, um, and uh, yeah, it was. Uh, and that was Mike's idea. Or yeah, this was all, all all his idea. He's yeah. Yeah, he seems like the kind of guy that just comes up. I with just felt bad for ideas. the guys on you know because he he filmed it, recorded, had Renee there shooting pictures, and I kind of. Felt bad for the, all those guys because I started doing the math. They had a rehearsal day, two show days. This is their day off travel day, and they're working in Marin an hour from where they're staying. And then they're going to do two shows in a row, have another travel day, and do three shows in a row. And I'm exhausted thinking about it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. That was during tour, I guess. That was then. in the day in between Seattle and Berkeley. Um, oh, so I flew I flew from Seattle <gasps> to Santa Rosa. Uh, my friend Jen picked me up, drove me to TRI. I spent about two and a half, three hours of TRI. And then I went to Oakland airport and flew home wow. on the same day. <laughs> Just to steal that traveling is intense. Yep. So I was, you know, mail, I right? did, did think twice. Like, I guess if I miss the flight, I go to the show tomorrow and fly home the next day. What do I do with that? <laughs> you have traveling down, I guess you have that shit wired. Uh, I mean, it, you know, if there was an unusual delay, I missed that, that session. Um, um, so, you know, there, there was definitely a little bit of risk to it. Uh, um, I think Mike's guys, uh, Renee and them were on the 9 a.m. flight that I took the noon flight. So, you know, I took right. a, little, a little more risk. So what uh, what is up with TRI Studios? Does it still get used? There was a time when Bobby was doing the live streams from there. Um, yeah, I mean, now it's basically a rehearsal space, um, particularly for Wolf Bros. Um, you know, we, we we've done a day rental or two here or there. Um, Bonnie Rate loves to use use. She particularly loves it. Um, she'll use it like for a photo shoot or just you know for almost anything tour rehearsal. Um, it, it, it you know we can record out of there. Um, um, though we don't you know we're not a op fully operational business. It's run by you know Bobby's people have to be in town essentially for it to be doing anything. I don't you know we don't have full time staff for it or even part time staff for it. 
Um, so it's, it's, you know, very Bobby based facility at the moment. Um, we can live stream out of there. Um, but you know, now that we're touring again, there's, hasn't been a lot of cause for that, uh, but we used a lot during the pandemic. Um, and yeah. we did, we were able to do a lot of upgrades to it then because it certainly needed it. I mean, you know, streaming technology improves yearly. And so it's, it's, it's expensive to keep up. Um, yeah, especially nowadays. So, yeah. Um, all right. This request has come up like 15 times tonight. I, I don't understand, but I, I've seen it in the joke, chat. It's a joke. Pecan. Uh, Thank you. People say it's pecan, which is something Del Monte makes. Pecan pie. Pecan pie. Pecan pie. Pecan pecan. Pecan. Pecan pie. Wait, now, now I don't know what the right way to say it. Kevin, is. how do you say it? Pecan. So it's pecan. 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 Right. It's usually think, the opposite of whatever Kevin says. <laughs> Oh it God! Is. I thank you. Love inside jokes. I have no like, idea what we're caused the war in the chat. I, I tell you what: when you go to New Orleans, ask people in New Orleans, say pecan to somebody in New Orleans, and they'll probably give you a slap. I mean, yeah, and, and, you know, I'm 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 wrong more often in the South than not, so I don't surprise me with pronunciations. So, what's your uh? What do you look forward to to eat? When you're at Jazz Fest, do you get a chance to walk over to the stalls at all? Um, this is going to be, you know, it's it's unfortunate that I haven't been there in 20 years, but this is going to be as hit or run trip as ever. I, I'm going to be there 36 hours, and then I'm right. on a plane, you know, two hours after our set to Ithaca, um, and they start loading. Which in. is opening with <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> like the Waco, Obviously, they're not doing it in New Orleans. <laughs> right. now, Kevin different. knows how I think. That 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 would that sounds just like me. Um, Perfect. Um, yeah, I, 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 I just love the jazz. Fest. I'm so, I haven't been to jazz fest since 2003. Like I said, I went nine years running before that and I miss it. I want to take my kids one year now that they're 19 and 17, you know, well, this would have been a good year. This would have it been, would a, have been a fantastic year, but yeah, the huh? youngest is graduating. So right. I'm really only going to be there 36 hours. So right. it's like the perfect there. amount of time, though. It's kind of like Vegas. It's, like, a, about, it's to, a little bit like Las Vegas. Yeah, so you don't need to be there for 48 too hours long. is about the right amount of time. Yeah, um, and especially if you're doing late the, night shows. So unless you bring in your own vegetables, because it, it can. It, yeah, it a couple years little, I went for both weekends. Couple years I went for both weekends and it was just a mess. I took the next week off after it was like I it was three weeks to get this you thing. go home. Or when I was working stay? for Warren, I felt like I was we were there six times a year. Um, it felt like we did Jazz Fest, Voodoo Fest, and Mardi Gras all in the same year. Um, that's a lot. And, uh, yeah, it was that's that's why I, that, thinking that I haven't done Jazz Fest in twenty years. I mean, obviously I've been to New Orleans outside of Jazz Fest, but um, I think I did it so many times between nineteen ninety eight and two thousand three that uh it added another 10 another 10 years of it and actually i went in in 96 i saw fish there just going uh on my own that's the first time i ever went to jazz fest just uh oh. with some friends for fun nice. so i, I went the weekend. i went the weekend after we get in the cab and uh we asked the cab driver how fish was and he's like i hate those people they don't tip <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's a lot like Vegas that way. The, the it's like you know you feel like you're draining your wallet on the way in and on the way out. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. It is. It's so expensive now. I paid twenty dollars the last time I went to Jazz Fest for a ticket. I think they're a hundred and something this year. Really? Per day. Were eighty, but I could be wrong. Yeah, it was eighty maybe. a day. I, I might have been looking at the platinum tickets. <laughs> I'm <laughs> sure there's that now too. Yeah. Of all the times I win, five times I've been down. I think I've only gone to the fest once. I usually just go down and do the late night shows and stuff. I usually skip because it's too. I can't ever get up in time. Yeah, I remember seeing and... David Grisman at Tipitina's late night. I remember yeah. Seeing, like yeah. Trey and Michael Ray and the Cosmic Crew in some dive bar. Oh, those are the best shows. Um, That's the best. Um, Trey was wearing a full Cosmic Crew getup and everything. Uh, <laughs> um, a lot of Almond Brothers shows. I feel like I saw that weekend. I think they played the festival and and the arena, and um, yeah, it was it was great. Yeah, weekend. it was always exciting getting the grids and then looking at the grids uh, and like looking at all the shows and how and then not you... one. Well, never <laughs> never make it to the festival, but going to the late night ones. I'd buy my late <laughs> night tickets. And I, those, I used to, never I used to do I used to do the festival every day because I had a pair of stealth mics and my deck, and I would just record everybody. I'd go some Zydeco band. I'd record them and. 
just to see what the I can get. The one thing I remember the most about the fest is being able to buy like 12 packs or cases in the middle of the, yeah. at the beer stand and like being like, oh my God, they don't just sell you like a beer. You oh, buy like you a case, it for you. and then you just walk around with cases of beer. It's great. Like it's so <laughs> fun. And then they get warm, but you know. What are you gonna do? It's great. I recorded Andy DeFranco one year, traded it with some guy in Europe, and it ended up being a bootleg. I started seeing it like listed, it had a name and some fake record label listed after it. And I was like, That's me, I did that shit. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> You've mine. done so much for the world of bootlegs, Kev. <laughs> for your game hand stickers and your recordings. <laughs> I'm a criminal, I'm a damn criminal. They should rename John Doe and the injunctions to just you know, <laughs> it's a great win. It's a great, great win. win. <laughs> You're what they have in mind when they're doing those things. Exactly. Oh, man. Oh, God. All right. All right. Well, I think we should do some plugs real quick. Um, we have we just put up the Tapers Choice shows. So if you haven't checked those out yet, check those out. Uh, starting with Cornell, not with Jazz Fest, but starting with the Cornell shows, we'll be doing after shows. Um, and then also we got some microdoses coming up next week. Uh I guess, Matt, you don't really have to do plugs because everybody watching here knows everything <laughs> that you got going on. I hope <laughs> it's a so. unique situation. Uh, you know. See um, Matt on the road this summer. So what uh Taper's Choice? What's what's their story? They're That's a... the guy from Vampire Weekend. Yeah, and yeah, the bass is from Real Estate. Band called Real Estate. They're an indie band. They sound they have this one song, Lila. Alex Perfume. Beaker. Alex, yeah. Yeah. Like yeah. And then Dave Harrington from Dark Side is the lead yeah. guitarist. And then Zach Tenario is uh, on keys. Very 74 Garcia, Wales, Grateful Dead, Saunders, oh, kind of atmospheric, great jams. Lots of jams. Yeah, they got, very a, they got a whole stick working with this song called the, the Dave song. What's it called? The Dave Test. The I Dave Test. So. And then at the end, the guitarist is either thumbs up or thumbs down. So you list it as yes or no. So they already got a little <laughs> stick worked in, you know. <laughs> I, I like that they wear their influences on their sleeve and they're like unapologetic about it. Like everybody, every jam band has parts that sound like Grateful Dead and parts that sound like Fish nowadays, right? right? Like it's just, that's just the thing. And I feel like a lot of- cover it up the most. Right, they're always trying to cover. And like Taper's Choice is just like, no, this riff is ripped right from Jerry. And like, they don't give a <laughs> shit. They're like, they own it. And it's like, it's cool. Cause it gives you, it almost like gives you like permission to just chill and enjoy it. And they, right, they're fun. Great. Yeah, it's an inch. It's my a favorite good band. thing is they lean into it. We are a jam band. We had right, them one, and they were like, "Yeah, everyone's like, we don't want to be a jam band. Don't cost that. We want right. to be a jam band." You know? Yeah. Good good I'm intrigued. Them. Well, you could check them out on Wook Plus because T edited. <laughs> uh... Just, uh, yeah, I went and recorded two shows that they did out here, and then uh, Lama and I did a couple interviews with them, and we put the interviews at the end of the show. So each set, at the end of each set, there's like a little interview with them, but it's uh. <laughs> Two nights, four sets. We recorded the whole thing, put it up on the channel. It's good. Cool. It's great. Just finally released it six months later, but we got it, we got it done, <laughs> got it out there. So it's good though. Yeah. They they're good. They're fun. They're I I yeah. Actually, I saw them at Fish. I ran into, I ran into Chris and called yeah, him Chris. Alex, tripping my face off, and I was like, Alex. He's like, I'm actually Chris. I was like, I am an asshole. I'm, an <laughs> <one of> the- <laughs> I'm on a lot of drugs. I apologize. He was at six too, and and I I I, I thought it was kind of cool that. Almost all of Mike Gordon's backstage guests met each other together, and Mike at uh, the Dear Jerry, uh, yeah, the Dear Jerry live stream we did at TRI in 2012. They had Chris Thompson and Jonathan Wilson, and um, oh. was there that night too. Uh, he was in town with Roger Waters' band. Um, That's a lot cool. of the, yeah, a lot of those friendships stem back to TRI. Poor Mike say, lost yeah. his keyboard player to Roger Waters. Yeah, Robert Walter. I would imagine even backstage at the bowl for the Willie thing had to be so fun. Just all the people hanging out and, and everyone like that whole, fe- that whole vibe has to be so cool. Like with those kind of things anyway, just seeing those guys and. But the Willie and, show. Did you yeah. Say? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Willie that was like, bowl. I mean, that was, I didn't expect the, fa- I actually thought I was gonna be a little out of my element. You know, I, I, I we did a bunch of Phil and friends, Willie Nelson shows in like 2001 or two, but 20 years kind of removed from that. Um, right. And so I, I, sort of thought it was going to be a little different and then it was really a huge family reunion um, that's awesome spent a lot of time with a lot of people we knew it was, it was really cool t i yeah, love how cool. you wake up at the end of the show <laughs> <laughs> pop right in there 
So I mean, it's, is, you know, out here at seven o'clock, it's showtime now. You know? <laughs> right? That was when we were down beating. This was the West Coast. I'm on West Coast time. I just yeah, got off go. work. <laughs> yeah, Chris Christopherson was there, and then Bobby got to meet him. Um, and I captured a sweet picture of it. Actually, did, did he say? Did um, he say, "Hey, Chris, I do one of your songs"? No, uh, you know, Chris is uh, Chris been struggling. Yeah, uh, I was gonna say. Yeah, you know, when he gets on stage, he's he's there. It's you know, he's just a little bit like with Tony Bennett right now, I think. Um, mm -hmm. um, you know, so, uh, but he was there and he was, you know, he, he was there early and present the whole time. Like it wasn't like hiding in a dressing room or, right. or on a bus. Oh, like we well, often fantastic. were, uh, yeah, he was, fine. yeah, he was there to shake hands with anyone who wanted to really. It was, it was kind of cool. That's um, cool. All right. Well, Very cool. I think we're going to call it there, man. I really appreciate yep. you joining us once again. Hopefully we'll get to do this again and, uh, yeah, have time. And uh, have a great time on tour. We will be watching and hopefully catch a bunch of shows. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. See you in LA. Yep. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>